Inside the Magic, covering Walt Disney World, Disneyland, Universal Studios, and more. These seats will be filled with the cast and the, and the creators and all the people behind this wonderful final episode. So let's just jump in and get started. Uh, first up, C-3PO, Anthony Daniel. Carrie Russell. <laughs> the legend himself, Lando, Billy D. Williams. You better get to your feet, y'all. You better stand up for him. You better stand up. On Twitter, had the best response to seeing the film. The whole cast, all the film last night. He said he cheered, he shouted, he fist bumped, he cried. It was everything that you hoped for. I agree. Richard E. Grant. <laughs> all right, look at them. Aren't they beautiful? They're fantastic, and they're all here. Exciting. So I'm going to ask some questions, and then you'll have a chance to ask some questions. And I'll just get started with. I mean, you knew I was coming to you. You tried to hide in the middle, but I was gonna have to ask you first, JJ. <laughs> trying to hide in the middle, but let's let's get started and just and just dive in. Um, you know, when I see here, excuse me, when I watched it and I had the opportunity to see it a couple of weeks ago, I think what you've done here is a real spectacular harnessing of craft. I mean, production design, costume, VFX score, sound design. You have a grasp on all these tools of the trade, but yet they're still in the midst of that a really um, a, a, a combustible emotion to it. So you've handled all of that so beautifully, so I commend you. And I wonder, as the only other person to take the reins of this twice, besides Mr. Lucas, um, what was the difference between your first day working on Rise of Skywalker and your first day working on Force Awakens? What happened in the middle? Were you more confident? Were you just as scared? What happened? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Ava, for being here. We are very lucky to have you. Thrilled to be here. Uh, I, I think that we, the difference is that the, the, the pressures shifted. Uh, we didn't know at the beginning of Force Awakens exactly what it would look like to have Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver and Oscar Isaac and John Boyega. You know, what would that cast be like? And we had to figure it out and discover it. The first day of, of Rise of Skywalker, we sort of knew some of those things. We knew those things were, were working. What we didn't know was everything else. And this was wrapping up, you know, not one film, not three films, but nine. And so the, the responsibility was significant. And the movie, I mean, this is a pretty big picture. I mean, the, the, the scale of the movie is pretty enormous. And we knew that none of that would matter, none of it would, would work if you didn't 
care deeply, and track with the people. So the most important thing, the people, we were good with. You know, we knew we had the, this incredible cast who I think have gone above and beyond anyone's expectations and are truly spectacular in, in the film. Yeah, yeah, they are, they are. The performances here, I really um, hope people pay attention to them. It's, it's in this blockbuster ramping, rapping that the performances here are so nuanced, so beautiful, so deeply felt. Really keep your eye on it, you'll all feel it as well. Just to continue to ask you though, you know, there's, this is not, not doesn't have a comic book to follow the story. There, there's no blueprint for this. This is coming out of you and Chris's head. And what you had talked about was, you know, wrapping up nine films. That's an awesome responsibility. So at the moment that you accept the invitation to do it, and it's the next day in your home, and, and you're thinking, oh wow, I gotta, I gotta end this thing. Just personally, as a longtime fan of it, what was your personal process to get there? Did ideas start to come immediately? Were you quiet for a while? Did you well, there, there, there meditate? Never, because it, we had worked on Force Awakens, uh, Larry Kasdan and I and, and Michelle Rejwan and Kathy, uh, producers, we, we had talked about quite a few things back in the day. So it, it was a bit of sort of picking up where we had left off. And, and the fact is that, that what, what Ryan Johnson had done in uh, Last Jedi, you know, had set up some things that, that were sort of wonderful for the story. One of the things being that, that the cast was separated, the characters weren't together for the entire movie, essentially. So this was the first time that the group got to be together. When Chris and I got together, we knew immediately we wanted to, you know, tell a story of a group adventure. There were some very specific things that we, we're both drawn to immediately. And we just started doing the thing that you do, which is you say, what do you desperately want to see? What feels right? And then my job as the director was to make sure that all the pressures of all the obvious things, fan expectations and studio and all those practical logistical issues as well, weren't brought to set. That, that on the set, we could have a sort of, you know, a, a, a sort of buoyancy and a, a, a sense of sort of being spry and while it was never quite an indie on the set of this movie, we needed to keep the thing feeling as, as human as possible and not like some, you know, a massive machine, which is part of it in the background, but nothing that creatively mattered to us. Yeah, yeah. Those moments when they come back together and they reunite every time it happens, you just lift up. Because you, I, I realized, oh wow, they, have, I, they work together this whole time, so they're fantastic. Beautiful moments of liberty and humanity. Um, Kathleen, no one really knows or rarely discusses that you started as a camera operator for Monday Night Football. <laughs> I think this is important. She was out there fighting yeah. for her shot. Who knew that? No, see, this Daisy said, I knew this, I knew this. So you're getting knocked around on the field, you're fighting for your shot. Um, so this is my question. How is Star Wars, and working on it over five films, what did you learn from those days on the field back in the 70s that helped you work alongside this great filmmaker to make this one and all of them? You know, I, I think I learned that there's never a job too small. Nice. Because when you're doing that kind of work, you, you get involved in every single thing that's needed. And that's why, even when I'm standing on a set, set today, if, if I see a cable that's kind of crimped, <laughs> and I think somebody might crimp or whatever, it's very instinctual to me to start dressing the cables and, and looking at things like that. It's just kind of a part of me. Yeah. And I think that that was very much something that was instilled when I did that job. Yes, I love imagining you doing that. That's my <laughs> point. I will tell a story that I also, in addition to operating camera, I did what's called a parabolic microphone. What is that? And at the time, it was a dish that was about like yay big. And you were the only person, and still today, you're the only person along with the photographer that can be right on the sideline. And your job is to pick up the noise on the bench, but also you need to be watching the play on the field. And I used to sit and watch football with my dad on weekends all the time, so I knew the game pretty well. And uh, I saw this pass play starting to materialize. So when you do this job, if it's gonna be a pass play, you need to start running. So I've got these cables on me, I've got this huge dish, and I'm running down the sideline. 
and I'm watching the pass. What I don't see is a Minnesota Viking linebacker who is running full speed toward me and takes me out at the ankles and I am flying through the air <laughs> like a miracle I didn't get killed. And I ended up on national television. We need uh, this footage. That was one, moment. please. <laughs> we have a lot of beautiful websites out here. Let's get this footage. Let's find it. Um, good one. So you're used to the nitty gritty. Well, this, before we move on, though, um, why JJ? Why JJ? Why this guy? Well, I told this story during Force Awakens. I won't go into detail on this, but I met JJ actually along with a filmmaker by the name of Matt Reeves when they were 15. And they had won a contest for movies that they had made. And I said to Steven Spielberg, why don't we hire these two young guys to come in and take your home movies and clean them up and, and give them a break and see if we can't give them a start in the business. So, needless to say, for years, Stephen and I watched JJ and his career just take off from that point. And when George Lucas asked me to step in and take over Lucasfilm, what I didn't know was that the, the company would be sold only months later. And when it was sold, there was an edict, so to speak, that we needed to make a movie in a fairly short amount of time. And the one thing I know about Star Wars, and the one thing I know about these kind of temporal movies, is this unique combination of needing dramatic storytelling, gravitas, and a great sense of humor. And I think that there's few filmmakers that really embody both of those things, and also have the capability to really manage something this huge. And JJ was my first choice. So Absolutely. that was an easy one. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, Chris, when the initial call came in to co-write this screenplay, how long did the kid in you do somersaults before the writer in you started to hyperventilate? Because I literally, I mean, I don't even know how you approach something like this. Uh, not, you got your mic? Uh, here. <laughs> I have two now. Um, not, not long, you, you spent about eight minutes doing something. I think it was on East 12th Street in Manhattan when, um, when I, I got, when I spoke to JJ. JJ had been calling and leaving messages and I was in a screening and I, I didn't have JJ's cell phone number in my cell phone. So it was sort of a random 310 number. And I thought, why, why is this random person in Los Angeles calling me? And finally I listened to the message and I, I sort of hyperventilated a little and I called back and he said, uh, hey, do you want to write episode nine with me? Wow. Um, didn't say the word star or war, just said right. episode nine. <laughs> um, so for a good eight minutes, I, I let myself sort of leap into the air, and then, um, and then we realized, oh my God, we, we, have, we have to land this vehicle somehow. We have to land the biggest star destroyer in the world on this, um, you know, on the head of a needle. And, uh, and then we, we got to work. I live in New York, but I came out to LA, and. Um, JJ and I just started in a, you know, at Bad Robot. There's a room with um, with these white boards, with these blank white boards, and we just started writing in dry erase marker on, on white boards, and then eventually the boards became a word document that was 10 pages, and then 50 pages, and then 121 pages, and then that became the script. I have to talk about the script though. Uh, as a, as a writer, this is just a mammoth undertaking. You have to finish not nine. This is the is anyone out there? Do you hear what I'm saying about it? <laughs> it's a finale of this whole thing. It's so beautifully done. The dialogue, the, you know, the, the act breaks. I mean, the, the art of the script is, you know, I, I just, I have to applaud you on it. This is an epic feat that no one else wants to do. Um, so I'm glad you all did it and you did it well. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, so thank you for that. I'm gonna jump into some of the, our, our newbies before we um, go to the OGs, as we call it in Compton, where I'm from. Um, so let's start with uh, Carrie Russell. Carrie Russell, who the hell are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? Um, you play uh, Zori Bliss. And I just have to tell you, love her. I mean, love her. She's hot, she's badass, 
From the moment you see her, you just, I just wanted to see more of her. She comes back later. We get it, I mean, she's everything, okay? She's a hit. All right, so I just wanna let you know that. Even though I didn't know it was you for a long time, um, so, I, so I read the credits. <laughs> but um, can you tell us a little bit about her? How did you approach her? And that the anonymity of being masked as an actor adds something new for you to play with. Um, definitely. No, JJ called me or emailed me and said, do you want to be in Star Wars? And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but then he told me about the idea about the mask, and yeah, I love, personally, I love the mask. I mean, that's my fantasy dream sequence, that I can see everyone in the super tough version of myself costume, and no one can see me. <laughs> I mean, that's my dream. Um, so, <laughs> um, it's a real power play in, in, in a way because you can, no one can really see what you're thinking, but you can see everyone else. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. And, and the other thing, because we all, are we allowed to say that we got yeah. to see it last night? Yeah, they all saw it last yeah. night, yeah. The other thing that was just, you know, I've known JJ for so long and I just feel like we have a shorthand and uh, we speak the same language in a way. And uh, I just feel like JJ got to, finish a piece of history, in a way, by getting to do this. Yeah. And it's just, he did such a great job. He really did. He really did. I, I was gonna say one thing, um, uh, thank you for being so kind. The, uh, Carrie loved the mask so much that the, the <laughs> first two days she worked as Zori, the entire two days, I never saw her face. <laughs> she could have, like most people, taking the mask off in between takes, or after a couple hours, or after the whole day. But she walked onto set in character with the mask on, not even in character, with the mask on. And she's like, hey, I'm like, hey, you wanna take that off? She's like, huh? And she had it on the entire time, and then the next day the same thing. And I, I got to work with Carrie for a couple days and never saw her. Very strange. And you would be talking to me and say, can you take that off? It's freaking me out. It is weird, because you're just looking at, you can't, you don't know. They're like, I know, it's awesome. <laughs> it is awesome, it is awesome. Um, another uh, new character, Jana. Naomi, welcome, how are you? Good. Hey, can I get your mic? <laughs> yes. So, uh, this is a big thing to step into. Um, you're, you know, for any actor with tons of experience and a lot behind them, it's a lot to step into, um, let alone someone who's newer to the scene. Yeah. So Kent, did you, did you just come in and say, you know what, I'm gonna walk on with just swagger, not be fearless, <laughs> or, or, or did you just, you know, just kind of, did you, did you, how did you prepare? Did you have a defining moment where you knew how you were gonna approach this? You know, I felt like it was a, it was really through the physicality. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I felt like, Jana, Jana's strength was in her body, like she's a very grounded character. Um, so when I got to training, that's when I started to be like, okay, I got this. Right. <laughs> okay. Like being able to do pull-ups and horse riding. And, and then I guess when that came, my confidence that I hadn't previously experienced. And, and then working with JJ and figuring out like what the balance was between, you know, uh, strength of a character but also a vulnerable side. Mm -hmm. You know, someone with a heart, we don't always have to just be like strong and fierce, but you can also, sometimes vulnerability is strength at the same time. So kind of finding that balance was really interesting. And I feel like we, we found it by the end. I mean, but literally, and also like, cause we watched it yesterday. I'm not being funny. Like I, I left it, like my heart was beating so hard mm -hmm. and it, it's the most visually beautiful thing. I've ever seen it. It makes you feel like a child, and there was an element of feeling like a child on set. That I mean, it's like the whole cast allowed that to happen, and JJ was the one who allowed us to be here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, very grateful. Yes, well done, well done. Um, and you're right; it is visually stunning film. Visually stunning film. Um, Kelly Marie Chan, you're back. Yay! You're back. Um, what was the camaraderie like on set getting the gang back together? Like I said, as you're watching, it's just so hard expanding to see everyone in the same scenes together. Um, what was it like actually doing it? Um, it was really wonderful. I think that there, from the last film, there seems to be such a you know bond between everyone. And then also the new guys. Like everyone just feels 
it sounds so cheesy and so cliche, and it is, but <laughs> it truly feels like everyone's a family and we're all just there to have fun and be part of something that's so much bigger than us as individuals. Mm -hmm. And that's a really cool thing to share with people. So. Mm -hmm. Your scenes, uh, you, you were in like large group scenes. Uh, uh, you, had some, you, know, you had individual scenes, but I remember you in scenes where there were just tons of other people and the resistance. Yeah. It's like all the costumes and yeah. and um, and it felt like th these scenes denoted community, right, in the scenes um, within them. But they also were um, very closely co closely connected to Carrie. Um, and so I wanted you to chat a little bit about, um, you know, the feeling on the set around doing that work in her absence. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think that was really, and I think for for myself, I can only speak for myself, um, there is sort of this idea that, you know, JJ has talked about ending nine films, and Carrie was such a big part of all of that. Um, so I think for me personally, there was a lot of wanting to honor this thing and do right by this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that she's pretty effing incredible in this movie. So, um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to see and to feel when she when she's present in the film. Thank you, um, Jonas. Yes. I really tried with the name when you came out. You gave me a full. You did great. But I think I think for the record, so that everyone has it on their cameras, say it the unbutchered way. <clears throat> Sometimes I Not the American myself, way, the like real yesterday. way. <laughs> yeah. Jonas Sotamo. One more time. Jonas Sotamo. Okay. You pronounce every word in Finnish, Finland. There's yeah. no, there's no, Finnish has no silent letters. No. We don't, we don't silence our letters. We every letter counts. Yeah. Let's try. Suotamo. Let's try. Let's say, let's say. Can I get a Jonas Suotamo? Okay, one, two, three. Jonas Suotamo. Come on, man. Go on and spread the message. Yeah. Learned something today. We did. We did. We did. We did learn something today. Chewbacca. Why? I love it. Why has he endured? Why do we love him? What are the qualities that endear him to us? You've thought about him more than than the rest of us. What is it? I mean, for for that, we we have to go back to 1977 or whatever, and when when George found Peter Mayhew mm -hmm. to play this character that was supposed to be, you know, nobody knew what it was going to be, and it's that thing where you don't know going into these things uh, uh, how it's going to how it's going to look, and I think Chewbacca's endurance has to do with the fact that Peter's unique physicality that I sort of inherited and I try to bring on screen, it created this character that moves not quite like a human, it's very unique, uh, the way Chewbacca appears on screen and he's, the way he's uh, so that that that's what created the memorability of that character and what people if they even if they haven't seen Star Wars they might know what Chewbacca is right. and that's that's what I'm a custodian of yeah. and that's what I've taken and uh, when Peter passed this last year uh, I was heartbroken and uh, but I, but I but I like to think that in or in, in this film you know I, I attempted to do him justice and while uh, working with this incredible cast. Uh, I'm really happy that we're part of something that's so much bigger than ourselves, but that we uh, we still get to uh, play and have fun in. And uh, for that, I'm forever grateful to be a part of this. Fantastic. That's beautifully said. Beautifully said. Thank you, thank you. Yes. And uh, if my son is here, I'd like to say, <laughs> <laughs> he, he knows what that means. He, he does, yeah. Yes, good, okay. <laughs> I think he's left to have a haircut, but, but yeah, he was here just now. All right. Um, so, Anthony Daniels, the great. Can we give him a round of applause? Woo! Um, immense respect for you, sir. You've been in all of the Star Wars episodes. This is your final walk as C-3PO. Uh, it's been a joy to watch you through every film. Uh, so thank you for what you've given. It's thank really you for fantastic. saying that, and, and thanks to everybody who has who has kind of been fond of 3PO over the years. Some of you will be yes. there. Thank you very much. More than fun. We love him. Uh, can you just sum up your journey as an actor? Um, you you you've done something in these films that hasn't been duplicated that no one else has done. 
Uh, you've touched every one of them. You've worked across all of the worlds, all of the planets, all of the ideas and the stories. Um, I don't know how you'd start to summarize it, but maybe you could try. Well, I just realized in, in the last few months something that I hadn't ever got before. Be, people, the questions I really don't like is, what was it like, or how does it feel to be in Star Wars? Well, I've only just realized that because I've been in all of them and, and all the spin-offs and stuff, I am so close to it. And I said it's rather like having your nose up against the planet. You can't see how big that planet is. And gradually now, I'm beginning to get a, a perspective on it. And that comes from talking to fans, to, to people who say what it, Star Wars has meant to them over the years. It's meant something completely different to me. It's a job, it's kind of fun, it's kind of awkward sometimes. <laughs> uh, it's gay, as we all know. Uh, it's not a smooth ride. But, but finally, I'm getting to see it almost from the other perspective, and, and that's the perspective of the audience, who've been there all this time, and I'm really glad to have survived all this long enough to get this perspective. You've got a unique perspective that no one else has. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for all you've given. Um, Richard E. Grant, your Twitter last night was epic. Your tweet was epic. Um, you were on cloud nine after seeing this film. I'd just like you to talk a little bit about your reaction to the film for those who did not see. Can you get back to that moment and share with us what you felt? I thought that Disney would sue me for- <laughs> You were very emotional. Because I think that you're not supposed to say anything about it, but um, I didn't tweet any spoilers about it at all. But the, the Having seen it first when I was a theatre student when I was 20 years old, and before any of the younger cast were even born, uh, it's an extraordinarily emotional thing to see the, just the passing of time that goes through all of these movies. And it felt really like a combination of everything that I've read in the Bible, Greek mythology, The Wizard of Oz, all you know, rolled into one in this extraordinary summation of the whole story that delivers an emotional wallop at the end that I was totally unprepared for, and I was wiped out, and I barely slept. So thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Check the tweet, it's awesome. Um, and you're a really good bad guy. You're fantastic. Um, Mr. Williams, I love your films. I have to read this part, I want to cry. I love your films. Your film, Lady Sings the Blues, was the first film I ever saw in my whole life. I was six weeks old. You have a famous line in that film, you want my arm to fall off, as you're giving Diana Ross the money for her song as Billie Holiday. My mom and her best friend were in the theater, I'm six weeks old, you say the line, you want my arm to fall off, they scream, I scream, I start crying, I have to leave the theater, they never get into it, okay? This is how long I've loved you, I just want to let you know that. So thank you for all that you've given. <laughs> You want my arm to fall off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so thank you for this part of Lando, sir. What's the matter? You don't like dark demons? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so your career is much bigger than, than movies for many people than it is for me. And I just want to talk a little bit about Lando and how you approached it as an actor coming back to a part so many years later. Did you look at the previous films? Did you just you know, use the script that was in front of you? What was your process as an actor to get back to him? Yeah, getting back to what I'm doing now? To Lando, yeah. Oh. No. Did really. you watch the old stuff? No. No. <laughs> you just jumped right in? Yeah. You remembered him? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, well, you know, the whole, the whole idea for me was uh, I have a lot of admiration for this young man called uh, Monsieur J.J. Abrams. Yes. <laughs> and it, it was uh, pretty much, I like, you know, when I worked with George, you know, that was an opportunity to work with somebody who was really extraordinary. And here again, I have an opportunity to work with somebody who's really extraordinary. Actually, we worked together at, um, when he was uh, doing Lost. I uh, played myself playing a killer, which I thought was a very interesting idea. <laughs> and I thought, this guy is really crazy. <laughs> but fabulously crazy. 
But anyway, uh, this has been a great pleasure for me, uh, coming back to uh, do Lando. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think that it would happen. Yeah. I just wrote it off, you know. And I said, well, I did what I had to do, and that was it. But when I got the uh, call from uh, JJ, and, and then when we met, I just, uh, I just sat there and I, I just chuckled. <laughs> you know, because I thought it was just a, a wonderful gift. Yeah. So I'm a very, very happy human being right now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That makes me emotional. That's wonderful. Never know what life's going to bring. Um, so one of my favorite actors is up on uh, this, this uh, dais, and um, I feel like he can do anything. His name is Oscar Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if, uh, I don't know. I think you can do anything. I don't know. I just want to throw things out and see if you can do them. But I won't do it now. I'm maybe ready to receive. Maybe another time. <laughs> maybe another time. So in this, you looking are... looking for work now, so... Are you? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Really noted. Thank you. Um, uh, the... It, it feel, Paul feels different in this to me. Um, he's a bit... I think he was always supposed to be a bit of a swashbuckler, but he's like dropped into the swashbuckling thing in this. Like, it's all... You're dripping swashbuckling. It's the pants? And the knee-high boots, really. Okay. I think it's... Really, Michael Kaplan that really brought that <laughs> swashbuckling to this one. You know? It's really good. I mean, did you do you did you feel that you were kind of in pocket in this, or that you found him in a different way? What am I seeing that feels different in him from the previous? Yeah, I mean, he's kind of always been a bit of a wild card energy uh, and figuring out where where he fits in the story and what story is being told. Uh, and I think with this one, uh, you know, JJ and I talked a bit. He, I remember JJ being excited about kind of um, dirtying up the squeaky flyboy image that he's had for a bit and uh, just revealing a bit more of his personality. And I think that really comes uh, out because I've been taken away from my little box in space and, you know, I get to join my friends this time and you really get to see the interaction with the three and the hope that uh, I think that he in particular brings in this one. There's a uh, uh, kind of a relentless, almost aggressive optimism that he has, uh, and and how that is tested, and uh, how he you know tries to be there for his friends, uh, tries to push them along even when it seems quite hopeless. Um, and then I think also the way that we approached shooting a lot of these scenes, there was a looseness to it. Um, there was things shot in, in big, beautiful, choreographed takes that are just astounding to watch, where. You know, you'll follow one character walking through this maze of an amazing planet with all these stormtroopers and aliens, and you realize it's all this one amazing continuous take within us talking over each other. So it was that kind of trust uh, that, uh, that JJ kind of, uh, that, that allowed, uh, I think, a real spark of vitality. Um, yeah, you have to look for these shots that JJ does, JJ does on time. Some of that stuff I was watching, I was like, how, how the heck can he do this? The blocking alone is nuts. I uh, can't imagine how it was to actually um, have to do it. Um, but part of this with, 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 uh, with uh, you and John, I mean, John's like walking charisma, like charisma on legs. Like if you look at charisma in the dictionary, it's John with legs. Um, the two of, it is. It's, I have a different dictionary, special one. <laughs> but the two of you have, I mean, it might be the greatest romance in. It's you know, juicy. It's, it's, uh, it's good. Um, but this connection, was it something that you all had to work at? Is it something that, that, that is you know, contrived and you really don't like each other? Like how, how is this, how, this clicking that we see on camera? Uh, John, can you speak a little bit to the relationship with? Um, yeah, I think, I think it was natural since the... Since day one? Yeah, like when Oscar first came in, there was some other actor that I read with and the chemistry was, it, it was, it was blatant and there was a natural vibe between me and Oscar. I don't even know why. I just like the guy, um, you know, I, I, and I just walked into my dressing room and it just, it was so sweet. He's like, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna run the scene for him? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I just like got in, in the dressing room, like yeah, well, butt to butt and like ran the scene together. Yeah, yeah. And then from then on, we've been in that 
position. Yeah. 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 It just is what it is. It's just a, a good chemistry. And I think, you know, I felt most comfortable when I was while auditioning, doing the scenes where Poe was involved anyway, because I've, I've always liked, you know, the guys in the film. I just like the boys, you know, I, I love that. I love that element. And, and, and it was, I was glad that we could find that in our relationship. Yeah, it really comes through. It's beautiful. It's really fun to watch. Um, Anything that you learned from this part that you were surprised that you learned now that you know we're we're at the final episode when you first tackled it um, to now, a big lesson that that he he gave you when he talks to you in his bed, and I'm not talking about JJ. I'm talking about Finn. Oh, wow, Finn. When Finn talks to you in his head, not when JJ talks to you in your head. Um, what does he tell you? I, I just like loyalty. Loyalty is something I I find very very important in my personal life. Um, I think it's is super important to, to, to be loyal and to understand the way in which people want to be loved and communicated with. It's like, you know, proactive love is, is something that Finn does on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. Throughout the film, a lot of the times, Ray is going off on this, you know, really hard journey as, as, a, as a, a character blessed with so much power and Finn tries to support her in, in, in that journey and sometimes it's hard. And you know, in my real life, you know, if, I, if I've tried to get in contact with you three, four times, and you're going off, I'm going to leave you alone. Mm. Finn's going to come for you and, and and try and make it work regardless. You know, right. that's some Jesus shit. Like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not built like that. <laughs> so I guess over the years, I've learned like more and more. You know, I, I, in in general, I, I'm a, I'm a nice guy. You know, but other sides, I, I'm not always nice, and I guess. That consistency of niceness from from Finn gives me questions in my head over the years. Yeah, sure. Mm, that's good. That's interesting. Finn, um, Jesus. Finn, Finn you're right here. Yes. <laughs> this is what we want to be written. Um, so, Adam, you. Uh, so, it, it, am I technically in the proper Star Wars lore? If I don't just call him Kylo Ren, he's also Ben Solo, right? Like, if I say Ben Solo, is that also accurate, or not? Can, can he not be Ben Solo, or is he rejected Ben Solo and I should not use those words? Wow, he's really thinking about <laughs> uh, Yes and no. Okay, well let me ask you, my question is, did, did, in your performance of Kylo Ren, did you allow Ben Solo and who he was before to influence the way that you played Kylo? Or was, once you entered into Kylo Ren, were you in a completely different space? Did you bring his legacy and his heritage into the performance with you? In this piece? In, the, in this one? Yes. Uh, I, I think maybe subconsciously. I don't think it's a, you know, when people are actively trying to deny a certain part of their lives, I think they can do it pretty successfully. And then it, it just uh, turns into what ha what is happening around them that brings it out of them. So I, I think maybe, but it's not, I don't think it's something that we uh, actively talked about of, about playing it, but it, it definitely is a thought mm -hmm. to have. And since, since you... That's, again, I think that's a testament to the writing that yeah. uh, from the beginning it was never someone you know, for, from the beginning, it being called Force Awakens was I intentional in that it was the Force Awakening for both sides, the light and the dark. And JJ, uh, even in those first meetings, talking about someone who is uh, uh, unformed and not a, you know, quintessential, in, in control, you know, uh, um, <coughs> of his faculties, knows where he fits in the, you know, which again is helpful for me as an actor because we were, we were figuring out the same thing. It, it totally echoes what's going on in the story, you know, especially in the first one, new cast, figuring out where you fit, uh, it, you know, in a legacy that spans, you know, um, so much time, uh, the end. <laughs> so that, that, that was helpful, but I, I guess, I guess it's similar in that, I guess it's a subconscious thought and playing it. I guess it's also a subconscious thought as me as an actor sure. thinking about it. Sure. Okay, makes sense. Um, so Daisy, this is such an emotionally and physically demanding performance that you've given here. I just really hope that the blockbuster wrapping of this beautiful film does not obscure this performance. Um, it's, it's deep and beautiful and you move me every time you're on screen. It's a credit to the writing and the craft. 
um, but also you just went there. So bravo to you. It's really it's fantastic. Um, what was the, the scene that presented you with the with the, the greatest, um, I don't know, the most rigorous demand, whether it's physical, because you're like very physical in this, as you always have been, but also just deeply emotional. Would you say the biggest demands were more the physicality or the depth of some of the scenes emotionally? And which one? Uh, it's a good question. Because, Thank you. Um, with the physical stuff, you train and train and train, and then the adrenaline helps you like on the day to like do the thing. But obviously the stamina needs to be there for you to continue to do the thing. But I would say uh, I was more tired emotionally because um, there really wasn't a day where I was like, no, oh, it's just a quick scene. Uh, coming from the last one, which was quite heavy, even the joyous scenes I found very strange uh, to do. And then obviously there's a lot of other stuff that's going on. And, and it's also tricky because understanding what JJ was asking of me, I feel like I know what you're asking, I just can't quite get there yet. So that was probably the most tricky thing and sustaining that um, emotion. And there's a certain, there's more of a, I would say like a, a, a singular intention that um, was, was tiring. Because as well, even in the emotional scenes, there's like a physical um, containment that is, Tiring. So really, I've not answered the question, and <laughs> both things were hard. <laughs> yeah. so what was it about the joyous scenes that that created more of an obstacle for you? It's just so strange because I've gone from uh, you know a girl with a lot of being like, please be my friend Luke, and he's like, go away, and I'm like, no, please. Um, and then you know, very emotional stuff with Adam. Um, so coming back was so great, but it would be so. Um, like easy to just flow into it that then you're like am i acting like is this what the is required because i'm basically bouncing off of oscar and john and jonas and anthony in such a joyous way that you just feel like you're having a chat with your pals so it's not like difficult in like a whoa way but it's strange wondering how that general vibe is going to sure. translate into a scene sure and how would jj know that it let you know that it was working or not working um, I could tell when it wasn't working because I'd look over and JJ would be like, <laughs> and, and there would be some seconds, and I'd be like, go on. <laughs> and uh, he'd come over and tell me what wasn't working. And when it, I think I felt when it was working because you sort of, you know, you're just like feeling the thing. So it's, so that's the look when it's not working, when you're like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Try again. Right? Um, good work. Uh, I'll just finish up here and then I think I've got everyone. Yeah? One last question for JJ before I open it up. Um, so for George, it was really important to him that these films mean something. That they are just, you know, popcorn films. That there's some universal truth to them. That something is being conveyed. That, that this is um, soul food. It's supposed to stick to your ribs. Um, and he wanted to say something for the ones that he worked on. You're the only director that's done it more than once besides him. Um, so in this final piece, I mean, I always hate getting this question, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway, my friend. What does this mean and what do you wanna say with it? Uh, that's a terrific question. Um, I like to think that when you're working on something, especially something, and I say something like this as if these kind of things come along all the time, and they, they never do. Um, and I'm, I'm still great, grateful to that call from Kathy. Uh, the, the truth is that there's the movie that you know you're presenting to the world. And then there's the thing that you're doing, not necessarily secretly, but, but meaningfully. We live in a crazy world. We live in a crazy time. And Star Wars for me was about hope. And it was about community. It was about the underdog and it was about bringing people together and seeing all the oddballs represented and the most unlikely friends, the most unlikely places and the family that you make is, is really your family, you know? And so to tell a story that is, of course, a giant spectacle and, and, and a sort of, you know, like you say, the blockbuster racket, but the thing that mattered to me most, more than all the spectacular, unbelievable, I, I would argue, best work ILM has ever done, all the departments going beyond expectations, 
the, the thing that matters, I would say most and only in the film is, is really the people who are sitting here, you know, and, and what you're watching and the eyes of the characters and the heart of the characters. So for me, rather than give away sort of themes that Chris and I talked about doing, you know, from the beginning and what, what our specifics are, I will say that it really is about hope and it's about coming back to a sense of possibility, about unity, and, and it's, if, if Star Wars can't do that for us, I don't know what we can. Amen to that. This is a dazzlingly, dazzlingly rendered film. This is a beautiful film. The craft of filmmaking in this. I hope you all, beyond all of the trivia and things we love, um, this is a love letter to this to this series, to the story. No one could have done it but you, and you did it so beautifully. I'm so proud of you, and so in awe of you, and everyone here. So thank you. And now it's your turn. Time to ask questions. How do we do this, Lucas? Everybody's just gonna shout it out. Lucas, Disney, shouting it out, okay. Here we go, Sam in the front. Yes, you. Here's a mic coming for you. Hi everyone, Kira Lynn with Hollywood First Look Features. This message is for JJ and Chris. Being able to sit down and write a screenplay of this magnitude, I wanna know what it was like when you guys realized that it was finished. Like you were done with the story. Like I can only imagine what that would be is like. It, is, yes. it, is it finished? <laughs> is it? Is it? Uh -huh. um, well, well, we we uh, there was there was a moment in the process when we were JJ and I were agonizing over something in the in the third act, and and we were in a room with you know Michelle Bridgman and Kathy and JJ and I, and, and we. Uh, and we, we couldn't seem to get it. And we went outside the room and Rick Carter, the production designer, sort of legendary production designer, said, I think the reason you and JJ can't write this scene is because you don't want Star Wars to end. <laughs> and I looked at JJ and we, we knew he was right. And then we had to go and write it. Um, and then of course the movie is remade, uh, you know, on the set and remade in editing and remade in scoring and remade in all kinds of ways. So we kept rediscovering the story. But I have to say, it was you, you. I think both of us mourned the moment when we typed the um, the characters' names for the last time. I mean, the the, the moment of joy you have when you type, um, you know, Lando and type some words underneath Lando is is something that is indescribable. But also the moment of, of sadness and longing when you type it for the last time is memorable. What Chris said. <laughs> I, I I will only add that that when I I called Chris about asking if he would be willing to do this, um, and you screamed because the, you were such a Star Wars fan, which I had been told. Uh, I was such a fan of Chris's, uh, had read a number of his screenplays, and, and Argo, I thought, was just so beautifully written, and I, I, I needed to have someone writing this with me who would, from the very beginning, remind me uh, of how much Star Wars meant, who hadn't been inside of it before the way I had. And I said to Chris at the very beginning, if you do this, you're gonna be with me the whole time to the very end. And Chris, being the humble man that he is, said, made some self-deprecating joke about how I won't want him around. That, you know, whatever. And, and we were together throughout production, uh, throughout post, uh, you know, in the trenches uh, with Michelle, with Kathy. Uh, kicking every tiger, you know, shaking every tree, doing everything we could to make sure that we were telling the best possible story we could. And I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for uh, this gentleman's uh, partnership on this movie. Yeah. 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 Look at the back, I see a tall hand right in the back. You, wait here. Yep. Thanks, Ava. Um, this question is for JJ. Uh, can you tell me about the process of integrating Carrie Fisher into the film and how you worked her to the story, the footage you had found from The Force Awakens, and what that process was like, even emotionally, for you and everyone involved? Uh, yes, I, I, like everyone here uh, who knew her, loved Carrie, and I, I knew her for a, a long time, uh, not very well, but I, I, I knew her for a while before Force Awakens, and um, you know, obviously, as we've discussed, the idea of continuing the story without Leia was an impossibility, and there was no way we were gonna do a digital Leia, there was no way we were, of course, ever recast it, but we couldn't do it without her. And when we went back to look at the scenes that we hadn't used, 
in Force Awakens, what we realized is we had an opportunity. And we could use that footage, use the lines that she was saying, use the, literally the lighting, the, that's amazing. <laughs> hey, watch this, the lighting. <laughs> um, that was creepy, hi Carrie. Hi Carrie. That's so Carrie, by the way, to do that. Um, really weird. Um, in any event, uh, we knew that we had the opportunity to use the footage to, uh, to create scenes that Leia would be in. And uh, of course, had Gary been around, and it's still impossible for me to believe that you know, she isn't, because we've been editing with her uh, for about a year, and she's been very much alive with us in every scene. And uh, it, it ended up being, you know, if we had Carrie around, would we have done some different things here and there? Of course we would have. But we had an opportunity to have Carrie in the movie, and uh, working with all the actors, uh, in including uh, Billy Lord, her, her daughter, who's in scenes uh, with her, we were able to, I think, do something that Carrie herself, uh, I'd like to think, would be, would be happy with. She is, uh, she's great in the movie, of course, um, and it's, it's still emotional and moving to, to think of, uh, of her and, and how sad we all are that she's not sitting here uh, with us today. Yes. Um, in the middle right there with the blue shirt, your second in there. Yep, you. You. No, you. You, sir. Just stand up. Don't wait. You can do it. Yeah, you. Yeah, do it. The question was, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> that is deep. Uh, um, I think in itself to be part of something, like a lot of people in cinema are talking about representation and change and aren't doing it. So I think in itself, being part of a team of people um, that look a little different, that are from different places, like in whatever form that is, gender, race, whatever it is. I think that in itself is um, a legacy to be proud of. Um, yeah, I think, and, and you know, like JJ was saying, this is a film of hope. Um, and I think we are reflective of the world at large. There are a lot of people up against magnificent forces that are fighting the good fight and, you know, and we're not, the characters aren't real, but what they're doing is perilous in the cinema. Um, so to be able to portray, you know, even a tiny part of that in this crazy world is uh, very special. Nice answer to a hard question. Last question. Wow. Okay, uh, someone's standing up and waving. There you go in the black right there. Can we get a mic over? My friends, thanks. Okay. Hi, congratulations on all the work that you guys have put in. My question is for John Boyega. Uh, I, I remember way back when you did Attack the Block and you had your first junket with like a press conference table. Like, how does it feel to have a global audience like love you for this character and Finn and for this, this production coming from where you came from as early on in your independent movie? Like, how does, just how do you carry yourself now with this global uh, respect and love from, from the world? Um, I don't know, I just um, I think I'm, I'm not the only one in it, so it is, it's, it's cool to be able to share the load, I guess. I've been on this journey with Daisy really more than any, anyone else, just in terms of circumstance and understanding of culture, where pretty much a, there's a 100% understanding of our background and where we're from. And then while we were auditioning, obviously we were, you know, I, I had more money than Daisy. Um, when we were auditioning. I think you had like 17 pound 55 in your account. <laughs> and it, was in, it was in minus two, so she was, she was definitely going over the transaction limit. And we were just able to relate on that, even that kind of level where it's, you know, most of the time actors have this kind of like, you know, kind of mystery about the personal things. We, were, we stripped that bear, and, and I think that having this connection more than anything, 
like if, if, if I feel any type of way or if I experience something that's weird or if I'm at a store and I'm like, oh, I just saw something, I always just message, message Daisy because I just know that that's somebody that would 100%, you know, relate. Um, and I guess this way has been my way of experiencing, you know, the, the, the whole thing. But it's definitely also been a, a, a huge life change for, for all of us. Um, and, and, and that in itself is, is exciting. I will say, and I said this when we wrapped up on our last day, that I really do genuinely respect JJ because he's not on the bullshit. And for me, I mean that as in, when you come into this industry the way I did, the way, you know, Daisy did, you get a whole bunch of promises, a whole bunch of people telling you this is gonna happen, that's gonna happen. Um, and JJ was like, yeah, you know what? We're gonna get you in for something, man. And I remember you were coming out of the um, editing room with Tom Cruise. I didn't really know who JJ was, to be honest. I was like, come, you're the side, man. That's Tom Cruise right there. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I, I remember him saying that, you know what, I, I really I really liked you in Attack the Block, and we're gonna, we're gonna get you in something. And in my head, I was thinking, man, <laughs> Cute guy, man. You know what I mean? I've seen you in 20 years, mate. You know what I mean? But, like, Bad Robot, I went to audition there several times before Star Wars, like on the TV shows that we were doing and other stuff. Um, and it just so happens that Star, Star Wars is what I was right for. But I appreciate you not being like the rest of this industry talking shit half the time. And, you know, you, you get it done, you know, and, 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 and I respect you for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's definitely not like the rest of this industry. This is a singular work. Thank you, JJ. Thank you, everyone here. Thank you, Kathleen, for being the shepherd of this, this, this beautiful story. And thank you all for being here. Can't wait till you see it. You're going to love it. Thank you.